silence on a somber day. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. This Remembrance Day marks a return to some in-person ceremonies in B.C. Other communities held events to honour veterans online amid ongoing pandemic concerns. The CBC's Benit Breach has more on today's commemorations around the Lower Mainland. For this family of eight, Remembrance Day means visiting a cenotaph every year. They need to learn about, you know, like that the freedom that, you know, our war, uh, warrior, you know, and all the soldiers, you know, like fight for is not free. They even have a flagpole in their backyard to commemorate veterans from home. We have to value what we have. Paying their respects to veterans like this. Eric Liebert served in the Canadian Army for 37 years, taking him to Cyprus and Bosnia. Lost uh, several of my friends, um, and it's important to take the time to remember uh, their sacrifice. While some ceremonies were virtual, others saw crowds gather to reflect. You just get the feeling from everybody of remembering and, and how everybody feels. remembrance for all of the lives lost from all over the world. Our community and our ancestors who fought in World War I and World War II, it's really important uh, for us to teach that to our children. And the symbol of remembrance is now 100 years old in Canada. Acts of remembrance mean gratitude for families like this, a time to lay wreaths, recite poems, and take quiet moments to give thanks. Benit Breach, CBC News, White Rock. In Burnaby, a wreath-laying ceremony was held in Central Park to commemorate veterans of the Korean War. And community leaders were there to share their gratitude for veteran sacrifices. Without their sacrifice, the present, the prosperity of Korea is impossible. Many Canadian leaders were there, including NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, members of Parliament and the Legislature, the mayors of Burnaby and Coquitlam, and the grand patron of Canadian-Korean War veterans. The start of the Korean War passed its 70th anniversary last year. Veterans were also present to pay tribute to fellow soldiers who did not live to see that war's milestone. And of course, the fact that uh, we made a lot of good friends in the military over our 20 years, and uh, you get scattered all over the country, you lose contact, but many of them have sadly passed on. As you can tell, I'm getting pretty old too. The wreath laying ceremony was hosted by the Korean War Commemorative Alliance and the Korean War Forgotten No More campaign. A special ceremony was held today in honor of veterans who were at risk of homelessness. The ceremony took place at the Veterans Memorial Manor in the downtown east side. Whole Way House Society hosted that occasion. They help vulnerable and marginalized veterans living with disabilities, addiction and mental health issues. Built in 1986 to support servicemen and women at risk of homelessness, today the manor is home to 30 veterans. In Kelowna, a day for reflection turned sour. Protesters put themselves at the center of attention and shattered the quiet morning there. Now police are getting involved. Formal events were curtailed because of the pandemic, but people gathered at the Cenotaph to pay their respects. The RCMP says up to 100 protesters took that opportunity to set up their own microphone and speakers to equate emergency health restrictions with war crimes. People condemned and challenged them. Not the right time, not the right place. One witness tells CBC News the disruption was the most heart-wrenching display he's seen in decades of Remembrance Day ceremonies. People began singing the national anthem to drown out the distraction, and late today, the RCP announced it is looking into what happened, saying it supports a right to protest, but when they choose to willfully interrupt the assembly of citizens at a Remembrance Day ceremony, that is a step too far. The Kelowna RCMP will investigate to determine what offense, criminal or otherwise, may have been committed, and if appropriate, the submission of charges or fines. Across this large country, many in-person ceremonies returned to honor those who served and the sacrifices they made. Ashley Burke has more from our nation's capital. A day to reflect on history. Canadians liberated this man's Belgian village in 1944. It was a rainy day and my father, knowing what was going on, told us today don't anybody uh, look out windows.
the number of Second World War veterans dwindling, now in their 90s. I'm still alive to talk about it. That's why it's important. <laughs> As older vets pass, those who served in Afghanistan become the face of this nation's efforts. This is the first Remembrance Day since the Taliban took over Afghanistan. Part of our soul is still in that country and, uh, and will be with us going to our graves. For Canada's top soldier, it's deeply personal. He served in Afghanistan with many of the 158 Canadians who died there. Their faces uh, go through my mind. And I think about what is happening now. And, and many of us are asking, you know, was it worth it? And that's a deeply personal question. But I have to tell our troops, I have to tell our veterans that you served honorably. We did everything that our country asked us to do. We provided the, uh, the people of Afghanistan time. Some still giving that gift of time to their counterparts they served with. We helped Colonel Sami and his family yeah. um, leave Afghanistan and they arrived in Ottawa two days ago. Yeah. And we're very happy that he's safe and his family is safe. Yeah. And they'll make wonderful Canadians. She saved our all family life. Their motto in Afghanistan, shoulder to shoulder. Now sharing this Remembrance Day, doing just that. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Canadian literature has lost one of its most influential Indigenous voices. Poet, writer and literary mentor Lee Miracle has died. She considered herself a scholar and artist, but was also devoted to social justice. In 2018, she was invested into the Order of Canada. A member of the Stalo Nation, Miracle wrote extensively on gender and sexuality, as well as cultural relations. The granddaughter of Tsleil-Waututh Chief Dan George, Miracle had recently returned to BC and was teaching at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Her family says she died early today in Surrey. Lee Miracle was 71 years old. Global shipping congestion might have you waiting a long time for a fridge or a new couch, but imagine waiting for your entire company. As Jill Ballard reports, a Burnaby woman and her small business could be on the hook for tens of thousands of dollars because of delays she cannot control. Zhao Jinghe dreamed of starting a construction management company, but her shipping container, filled with supplies from China, was flagged for random inspection by CBSA. The problem is, there's no room at the examination facilities due to the global shipping backlog, and she's been hit with fees. After everything is said and done, we might end up with a bill, a death that need to take years to pay. While the shipping container sits at Delta Port, he is incurring growing daily fees, both from the port and the shipping company MSC. The container is set to be moved by December 6th. By that point, the fees from Delta Port will total more than $10,000. Meanwhile, MSC will charge more than 16500 American, including a $5,000 late fee. In all, she's looking at the unexpected bill of more than 30000 Canadian. And that doesn't include the cost of inspection and the extra daily fees from the shipping company following the examination. Six months of hard working, years of saving, and the dream to become a better, to live a better life, all scattered because of those random inspection. Worried the bill will kill her business before it even starts. I feel helpless. I don't know what to do. I don't know who can I turn to. The international shipping industry is currently gripped by severe congestion. Once the pandemic hit, much of the world came to a halt. Factories closed, ports shuttered, and transportation companies struggled to find staff. Consumers turned to online shopping. So there was a surge of product demand, but unfortunately, not enough ships, not enough containers, and ports uh, uh, with many delays. So. That just accumulated over time and just got worse. This issue of supply and demand risking the livelihood of small businesses. This supply chain issue is um, probably the most unwelcome news for small businesses. For her part, he just wants the CBSA to recognize the unprecedented financial impact from the inspection wait times. Why should we as a small business need to pay for all that because our infrastructure is so left behind. Our systems is so broken that couldn't handle 
the, the, the search of the containers. For now, she has to wait, both for the container and the unwanted bill. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Delta. A shortage of hockey referees across Canada because of the pandemic is keeping players off the ice. While games have resumed after a more subdued season last year, Hockey Canada says referee registration is down across the country 30 to 50 percent in some cases. Refs have to be recertified every year. Some are blaming the shortage on the fact the lack of games during the pandemic meant many officials found other jobs while others didn't recertify. I would say right now, pretty collectively, U15 and U18 categories are seeing are being hit the hardest because that's where the attrition has occurred. And the new officials in are sort of starting at U11, U13. So they're not ready to make that step. To entice former officials, BC hockey has reduced and in some cases gotten rid of registration fees. But across Canada, the situation is worse. Hockey Canada says Ontario and Quebec have experienced a 50 to 60 percent loss of referees. A Victoria woman has joined the ranks of the fully vaccinated. While that's not unique for many British Columbians, how she did it certainly is. As Brady Strachan shows us, her vaccination journey was a difficult one. Annie Tal is grateful to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Earlier this year, Tal didn't know if that would be possible after she had a severe reaction following her first dose. About the seven minute mark, I started to feel my throat itching. Tal was suffering from anaphylaxis, a treatable but potentially life-threatening allergic response, in this case to an ingredient in the vaccine. I noticed that uh, my face looked like I had a full sunburn, which it had in a few minutes before, um, and my throat was very hoarse and, and itchy and scratchy. Nurses at the vaccine clinic gave her epinephrine and called for an ambulance. Tell spent the next six hours in hospital before being released. Health officials say an anaphylaxis reaction after a COVID-19 vaccine is very rare, occurring in just six to 10 cases per 1 million doses. Despite her experience, Tal still wanted to get fully vaccinated. So we'll be prepared two okay. doses of yeah. Pfizer for graded dose administration. That's and... where Dr. Scott Cameron came in. He used a procedure called graded dose administration, where he injected Tal with several doses of small amounts of vaccine over the course of an afternoon. And this allows their body to get used to the dose we've given them so they don't have a reaction. And the vast majority of patients that undergo this are able to tolerate the vaccine. He says people worried about vaccine reactions should speak with their doctor. Driving in your car every day is more risky than going and getting this vaccine. And I really think if, if worries are stopping you, take a step back and look at that. As for Tal, she says it's important for her to share her story. If I could help one person kind of feel maybe a little bit more secure uh, or safe or talk to their doctors about getting the vaccine, then, then that's what's important for me. She's looking forward to getting her booster dose when she's eligible. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna, British Columbia. The Canadian Coast Guard believes most of the 109 containers that fell off a cargo ship anchored near Victoria have sunk. The containers fell overboard from the MV Sim Kingston during a storm in late October. Then a fire broke out on board the vessel that was circling near the entrance of the Juan de Fuca Strait. Four containers filled with fridges and running shoes washed up on northern Vancouver Island. The agency says it's working with the ship's owner to determine if it's feasible to try to find the 105 missing containers. Several hypothermic hikers and their injured dog have been safely brought down from Mount Seymour. North Shore Rescue says the hikers were trying to save their pooch after it got hurt yesterday partway up the mountain. They called for help. Rescuers found them with mild hypothermia. They were able to walk down. The pooch, though, couldn't bear its own weight, so rescuers took turns carrying it on their shoulders that's after the dog wasn't able to relax on a stretcher. Another wet day in the south coast. Time for our first look at the weather across BC, though. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy has our forecast. Colette. Well, Dan, here we go again with another potent storm that's making its way in and lots of moisture to work with here. Strong winds as well. I'm going to start with that rainfall warning and the areas that are involved. Now, upwards of 50 millimeters. Some areas could see a little bit more than that localized, but just letting you know it does include Metro Vancouver area. And we're talking about Coquitlam and through Maple Ridge and through that re region north and west van as well into the Fraser Valley. Uh, also 
how sound included. And as for those wind warnings, we're talking about winds of 90 to 110 kilometers an hour. Now that's for the central coast and northern portions of Vancouver Island. So timing on this well yeah working its way in this evening coming in but we get it through the overnight and some of the heaviest rain there'll be bouts of more significant rain through those overnight hours and then tomorrow morning get some improvement but still a chance of showers we keep most of the cloud cover though uh, you'll be seeing that and some mixed precipitation and light wet snow into the higher elevations there's a look at some of those stronger winds that we're talking about even for the city we're looking at winds 40 50 kilometers an hour from the south and that's why we're we're actually going to likely see our temperature rising through the overnight hours, only a degree or two. I'll go into more detail on that and how the weekend is looking coming up. All right. Thanks, Colette. Negotiations at the UN Climate Summit in Scotland are down to the wire. Progress is being made on a global agreement to cut carbon emissions, but there are some key details still being hashed out. Our senior meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is in Glasgow with more on the most contentious points. Well, we are now getting down to the end of the second day of negotiations and things are getting tense in here. Uh, exhaustion is setting in. Negotiators will be working through the night and there are some major sticking points as we continue to get uh, new drafts, uh, mainly around Article 6. I want to talk to you about that one. This uh, was the source of a breakdown in the Paris Climate Change Conference. It ended up delaying the signing until Saturday and it ultimately got left out. This is language about allowing countries to buy credits from each other. And the red flag has been raised by NGO groups, human rights, uh, that this would allow rich countries to continue business as usual. Uh, also uh, worries about loss and damage. We know that we failed on that fund for developing countries, the $100 billion a year after Paris. So uh, there is agreement that we need stronger language but uh, back and forth about where that floor needs to start and developing countries needs to st say it say as it says it needs to start in the trillions uh, so those are the big sticking points uh, today uh, we did have a bit of a positive note you know coming out of the news last night that the u.s and china the two top polluters will be working together over the next nine years uh, there's a lot of science in this draft and uh, i actually wanted to share a conversation i had with a broadcast glasgow meteorologist I think for a Scottish audience, it's um, it's actually a bit of a hard sell. To most Scottish people, a warmer, drier summer, perfect, what's wrong with that? But of course, we know that that's going to bring heavier downpours when it does rain in the summer. I mean, you, you've had 50 degrees in Canada. For us, it's been fairly comfortable, um, but we need to think about what's happening elsewhere around the world. I actually spoke to uh, the chief from the uh, Nicheleth First Nations on Vancouver Island who is taking the BC government to court in March asking for uh, his land back to his people saying that indigenous stewardship and the nature-based solutions that they have about uh, caring for their land uh, needs to be uh, seen in a public eye. Ultimately, he didn't get to talk to the people he wanted to, frustrated uh, that uh, he was unheard uh, in the walls of the negotiating uh, center, but some positivity about the other relationships he forged. Take a listen. We just get the general sense that, um, you know, <laughs> that we don't really matter to uh, the rest of the world. You know, we're just kind of disposable, right? I was trying to make sense of this whole conference and uh, I found the, uh, the more beneficial relationships have been made outside the gate, you know, with a lot of uh, other indigenous communities around the world. So we have a lot of uh, similarities, you know, similar battles and hardships, right? It really seems like there have been two threads, uh, the corporate talks that are happening inside these walls and the uh, positivity and uh, solutions that are happening outside. So we'll see if those two can come together about this time tomorrow. Johanna Wagstaff, CBC News, Glasgow. Faced with long waits from COVID, Albertans are flocking elsewhere to get medical treatment. Where they're paying out of pocket and why? Coming up. Thank you for staying with us on our commercial for live stream tonight. It started as a social media post asking for 100 birthday cards for a veteran's 100th birthday last year. As Talia Ricci reports, the now 101-year-old has not only received thousands of cards, he's been sent art, plaques, and even has a street named after him. He's getting cards constantly. They've never stopped over the two years. So we're in the 
lower level of your shed, but it's kind of become something more like a museum. Yes, it has. <laughs> it started with a call out for birthday cards, a call that was answered across the globe. Can you name some of the countries around the world that you know have connected with you and Fred? I'm trying to think of some that did not connect with us. <laughs> From Antarctica, he's received cards, uh, New Mexico, all over the world. And much more. Fred Arsenault has received art, quilts, and plaques. He's been on the front page of international newspapers and had trees planted in his honor. Another lady, Tina, that we've met through this whole campaign through Dad, uh, had a custom pair of wooden shoes made for Dad. It's a long way. Every weekend, we FaceTime Tina and she sings to Dad every weekend, something we really look forward to. He's uh, received cards from the tenors from Saturday Night Live, the CEO of Rolls Royce, our ex Prime Minister, Mr. Mulroney, sports celebrities, Kate's mom, Carol. So she wrote Dad a beautiful letter thanking wow. him for his service. And she also provided a photograph of Kate and the Queen. But one of the things that resonates with Ron most is the stories being shared. Ton was his name. Uh, he said he met Dad in 1944, and what Dad gave him, he gave him a cop, or he gave him his hat badge that they wear, and he gave him a copy of this Maple Leaf, the newspaper back then. The students are asking their teacher about Dad that they want to reconnect. They have photographs of them in the classroom. So it, it's, it's got this going where we are remembering. And so the second level here is all card storage now? Yes. And these boxes look full to the brim. That they are, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the How many do you think in total you have? Oh, well over 100,000. Wow. Well over 100,000. He was receiving five, minimum 5,000 a day. I don't know what we're gonna do with these 100,000 cards and all some of the stuff that you receive, but we just can't get rid of them. You know, it's history. Happy Memory's Day, Dad. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, friends. Thank you, Dahlia. Thank you. Today's in-person Remembrance Day ceremonies are a good indication of how far we've come in this pandemic. In Ontario, COVID case numbers have been pretty stable this fall, but as Katie Nicholson explains, there is concern that could be changing. Just hours after getting a new hip, Tim Gibson was up and at him in Montana. After learning of long surgical waits in Alberta, Gibson drove five hours and spent $37,000 to have a hip replacement in the U.S. You know, you could be two to three years before you're ever on, a, on an operating table. It, it might be one to two years before you even see an orthopedic surgeon for a consult. Alberta's healthcare system has teetered on the edge of collapse several times during this global pandemic. More than 45,000 surgeries have been delayed or cancelled, and the backlog is real. Surgeons say up to four years from referral to operation for joint replacements. And having to tell them how long it's going to be for surgery. You know, it's, uh, there's a lot of tears, there's a lot of anger. It's not a good place to be. The Alberta government says it's working through its surgical backlog more quickly than other jurisdictions, but not fast enough for a growing number of Alberta patients who are looking to the other side of the border for a solution, if they can afford it. At Logan Health in Montana, where Tim Gibson went, inquiries from Albertans are up a solid 50% in recent months. So primarily orthopedics, so your hips, your knees, your spines, by the time the patient gets here is they are stating that they don't know how much longer they would have been able to go. 
Gibson's surgery was a success, but his Montana surgeon says he's probably going to need his other hip replaced in a few years. If he has to wait for that surgery in Canada... It's not the doctor's fault. It's the system. And, and that is what is handcuffing us. Gibson says he won't hesitate to go back to Montana for that surgery, too. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And apologies for there was a technical error. That piece was on Albertans heading elsewhere for medical treatment due to COVID cancellations. Now to Ontario and the growing concern over COVID numbers. As we said, today's in-person Remembrance Day ceremonies are a good indication of how far we've come in this pandemic. In Ontario, the case numbers have been pretty stable. But as Katie Nicholson shows us, there's concerns that could change. And go back to the Valerie Skinnera puts her flamenco student through her paces, albeit six feet apart. We were told we should only be using 50% of our space. That means she maxes out at seven fully vaccinated students a class and intends to keep it that way well into the spring. So I think we have to keep vigilant and there's no problem with that. On Wednesday, the province announced a pause on lifting some of the last remaining capacity limits for nightclubs, wedding halls and event spaces where there's dancing. This is the number of daily new cases almost doubled since last week. I think it's the right time and I think uh, especially as we're going into the colder months where as we're seeing in some other provinces right now there certainly is increasing uh, cases and this is an attempt to uh, sort of prevent uh, that from uh, really kicking off. It already has in Sudbury. The city posted the highest rate of active cases in the province Monday forcing it to reinstate some masking, distancing and capacity requirements. Some things happened uh, one to three weeks ago that might be affecting our numbers. These things include the lifting of capacity restrictions on certain activities. This, he says, could also be the result of Thanksgiving and Halloween parties. This is not a blip. This is something that's going to be sustained for a little bit. So we have to be a little cautious as the holiday season approaches. That means sticking to what works, masking and physical distancing. And while Skinura would love to bring back packed classes and performances, she's okay to wait until the province says it's safe. So I'm just going to keep moving ahead cautiously and not rushing towards reopening. So for now, distancing, masking and temperature checks. The most important moves in her studio. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. He helps put names to unmarked graves across Canada. Up next, we're going to speak to a veteran who is on a mission. You'll want to hear this. Remembrance Day is a time to remember those who died in our wars, but it's also a time to honor those who came back. 93 Canadians have come back from wars with the Victoria Cross, decorated for exceptional courage on the battlefield. Only six of those men are still alive today. Dan Bjarnason has the story of one of them, a sergeant from the Second World War. I don't know what a hero is. Unlike the stereotypes in so many movies and novels, most real-life heroes are not oddballs. Some are, but most aren't. Most are like Smokey Smith. Most real heroes are extremely ordinary people who, through chance, found themselves in extraordinarily perilous situations and then did extraordinary things. 42 years ago, almost to the week, Smokey's Canadian Infantry Unit was fighting its way up the boot of Italy. His company was trapped on the enemy side of a river. You know, we waded across, the water was up to our chest, and we reached, it was raining like mad, and when we reached our objective, which we reached, and uh, we were attacked by tanks, uh, nearly everybody either got wounded or killed. Ask Smokey how he got his medal he says something about the river rose and then things got noisy. We knocked out uh, a few tanks and support weapons. And, you know, just one regular mill, big battle. There was a bit more to it than that. The official citation is an exhilarating account even today 
Alone and unassisted, Smokey knocked out one German tank, mowed down enemy infantry, stalled another tank, and drove off an attack single-handedly. He also saved his buddies. Can you remember how you were feeling? Was your heart going like a locomotive, or what? The... No, not really, no, I don't think so. I mean, I've been in so many actions that uh, one more was no different than the other. No different? Well, hardly. They don't talk and about it much down at the travel agency that he and his so wife they, operate. They they had, had, and down at the <laughs> bank, no one there is aware of at least one treasure in the vault. Smokey's busy afternoon in Italy won him the Victoria Cross, the highest military award in the Commonwealth for bravery. Smokey was briefly a celebrity. He met royalty over and over. He was in comic books. Probably. He couldn't understand the fuss yeah. then or now. I had a general tell me one time after God, he says, you have to remember that you'll be a lion eyes all your life, and I didn't even know what he meant. And, and I guess I still don't know what the hell, the hell he mean by that, you know. Smokey you know Smith remains today yeah. the same ordinary guy he was back then. Nothing special, just an ordinary hero. Danby Arneson, CBC News, Vancouver. Here are some of the stories we're following for you tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Why should we as a small business need to pay for all that because our infrastructure is so left behind? Our systems is so broken that couldn't handle the, the, the surge of the containers. A Burnaby woman is facing tens of thousands of dollars in fees after her shipping container was flagged for a random border inspection. And there's no room at the examination center because of a worldwide shipping backlog. She fears her business will die before it even opens. If I could help one person kind of feel maybe a little bit more secure uh, or safe or talk to their doctors about getting the vaccine, then, then that's what's important for me. A Victoria woman is now fully vaccinated, but her journey to two doses was not easy. Any Tal suffered anaphylaxis after her first shot. Doctors say it is a very rare reaction, so her physician gave her very small doses of the vaccine over an afternoon, allowing her body to adjust. For those still concerned, he says driving is more dangerous than actually getting the vaccine. And from Vancouver to White Rock, Kamloops to Victoria and beyond, British Columbians marked the sacrifices of veterans living and dead on this Remembrance Day. While some cities held in-person events, others asked to watch from home as the pandemic keeps people physically apart. For two-thirds of his life, Corporal Peter Engensberger has been, given a, has been part of a key Remembrance Day ceremonies over the years, contributing however he can. Today, he was given a gift. He soared over the cenotaph in Prince George, all thanks to a pilot who offered him a seat on his 1938 biplane. Tiger Moth was brought over from Britain by a doctor in McBride in 1969. And Dr. Coburn, Jeff Coburn, he then restored it in the 70s and flew it out of McBride all through right up until 2016. Uh, my friend Gary Wright and myself grew up in McBride, so we were around the airplane growing up. And when the doctor was getting ready to sell it, Gary decided it might be a good idea to buy it. So we, we picked up the airplane in 2016. He got a hold of uh, the Legion to see if they wanted us to fly overhead and it took several days. They got back to us finally and uh, said, yeah, that'd be great. I got a phone call from the uh, parade commander for the uh, Remembrance Day services. And he asked me to volunteer and gave me the choice between carrying a flag <laughs> at the cenotaph or doing the fly past. So I've never done the fly past, here I am. It's not something I would go out on my own to go and do. 
So when I'm given an opportunity like that, you, you just can't say no. You have to jump in and do it. <laughs> All right. She just will not quit that girl. I'll cure what ails you. Okay. If you walk in the veterans section of a cemetery, you may see graves that have no names. There are thousands of unknown soldiers lying in cemeteries across the country. Since it was founded in 1996, the Unmarked Graves program has found the identities of more than 7,000 previously unknown veterans and has given their families markers and headstones free of charge. They plan to identify 1,000 more this year. For more, we're now joined by Glenn Smith, a Canadian Forces veteran and BC's coordinator of the Unmarked Graves program. Glenn, first of all, how many uh, unknown soldiers, if I can call them that, unknown veterans are there in Canada? And, and how did that come to be? Well, Dan, uh, Veteran Affairs Canada last year estimated that there's between three to 4,000 veterans in unmarked graves at this current time. Um, based on my experiences in the short time that I've been involved with the last Coast Fund, I suspect it's much higher than that. Mm. Can you tell us more about the work that goes into researching cemeteries and tracking down the identity of even, of even just one unknown soldier? Um, I will attend uh, a cemetery, uh, usually local. Uh, I'll go to a veteran section if it has it and start walking amongst the visible headstones and foot markers that are already there. There's rows and rows of these headstones and markers. They're usually spaced about three to four feet apart. And often when I'm walking through a cemetery, I'll come to a point where the foot marker or the headstone isn't there. It sends a bit of a red flag to me. And I suspect that that is an unmarked grave of a veteran. This past summer, I was in Nanaimo I went into the Royal Canadian Legion to introduce myself to the people that worked there. And uh, off to the side of the reception area, there was a man and woman waiting, and they were listening to the conversation that I was involved in with the people at the Legion. And afterwards, when the conversation was over, the husband approached me, and he told me that his grandfather was a World War I veteran, and he was in an unmarked grave in Mountain View Cemetery in Vancouver. And I was fortunate to locate this individual, this veteran that died in 1938. I found his military records in the Library and Archives Canada website. Oh, they were so, so happy. The, uh, the gentleman asked, how soon can we get the headstone put on there? He told me that his grandmother, the veteran's wife, was also buried in an unmarked grave beside his grandfather. And at that time, I was able to inform him that there was a possibility to have his grandmother's name, birth date, and date of death placed on that military headstone along with her husband. Glenn, lastly, why is this work so important to you? Uh, it's important because so many of these veterans have been resting in unmarked graves for many, many years upwards of 100 years in a lot of instances. The identity isn't known of that person. So when I can identify that unmarked grave, proceed with researching it, and in the end finding that there is indeed a veteran in that unmarked grave, it gives me a sense of being able to provide that veteran back with his or her identity that has been missing for so long. Glenn Smith, we appreciate your time and your service. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the opportunity. It is a stain on our history. Japanese Canadians forced from their homes. Coming up, despite getting older, the memories of that chapter in their lives continues to haunt. And at 6.39, a live look at downtown Vancouver facing the North Shore. Another rainy South Coast day, and that trend continues. Colette Kennedy will have your BC-wide weather forecast after this. Okay, what if I underfill the tires or overfill them?
What if I only fill the tank halfway up, like ever? How about I just drive really slow, like really, really slow? Is there a way you can save money on gas? With the price at the pumps stuck in record-setting territory, it's a good time to ask. How much to fill up your car these days? Uh, it's uh, like uh, 75 to 80 dollars. It used to be 40 dollars. It's about 60 dollars almost now. 60 dollars? Yeah, for the size of a tank, yeah. Have you tried driving differently or doing anything differently behind the wheel to save money? Yeah, I, I tried robbing banks to get some extra money, but that didn't work either. Right? At the garage, it's a question people have been bringing in along with their vehicles. People ask all the time if there's any way that they can save some money by uh, driving their cars more efficiently. It's coming up more and more now that the cost of gas has gone up, uh, especially when people come in and they're looking to get repairs made. They'll say that they've noticed that their car is not as efficient on gas as it used to be. Uh, but most of the time, it's not that their car is worse on gas, it's just that gas is more expensive. The question is also coming up at Saad Ahmed's driving school, and not just from students. From one car, we gone to two cars, and this year I got two more cars. So now four cars running at the same time on the street. It's a, like a really big impact on my business. Uh, as you know, it's a driving school, so we have to be on the road all the time. End of the day, you need to fill up your tank, and I can see huge, significant changes. But sadly, both our driving experts told us it's hard to make huge, significant savings on your gas bill. I tried so many different ways, but uh, it, to be honest, like it didn't help that much. One of my friends says, like, I'm trying to keep my car as light as possible because I feel that, like, uh, if, if, if the car is too much heavy, it's going to consume too much gas. I'm like, eh, that's not sure. For sure. I don't know whether it's true or not, but uh, they, they tried. Like, people are desperate at this point to come up with different ideas, like, so whichever way they can save some money, right? So while changing your driving habits may save you a few cents a liter, the only sure way to save big on gas is to look for ways to burn less. Whether it's planning your trips when you're coming home from work to run your errands on the way home instead of making a special trip out, uh, avoiding idling while you're in the driveway, like even going to drive throughs you could easily spend 15 to 20 minutes in a drive through waiting for a cup of coffee. All that time that you spend idling is gas that you're burning. There is no magic solution for sure, but at the same time, if you can make a plan before you travel and have some alternative plans in your head too, like so that if something goes wrong, you know which way to go home. Until then, you have to pay whatever it says on the on the billboard. That's what it is. That's the reality. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Canada has now joined other countries and car makers vowing to accelerate the transition to low emission vehicles. As Chris Brown reports, the Scottish city of Dundee has become a leader in the electric vehicle revolution, and leaders there hope others will follow. If one of the aims of COP26 is getting people on an accelerated path to switch from polluting vehicles to electric ones, that road may go through the Scottish city of Dundee, about an hour from the summit. I must admit, uh, you don't have the rattles and bangs uh, as you normally do. Much of Dundee's city vehicle fleet is now electric, including Bob Donachie's garbage truck, or bin lorry as the Scots say. Kids gave cool names to the rest of the new electric fleet, like Leonardo Di Chargio. 20% of Dundee's taxis are electric, and the city has installed charging hubs at key locations. With the city taking the lead, Fraser Crichton says people and businesses are following. The infrastructure has to come in first before people will then start buying. These retractable EV chargers operated by a phone app are another novel feature. They don't take up space and they make electric vehicles accessible to more people. 51% um, of the population in Dundee live in tenements, so they do not have driveways. They're not going to be able to, to charge um, at their own home. But while governments can kickstart the process, getting enough chargers to power the whole of the UK, 
will be so expensive it will require a new way of thinking, says this e-transport advocate. She says it means ending subsidies for fossil fuels. When you look at how much is invested in fossil fuels nowadays, and you direct it potentially towards that funding gap that we are experiencing, wow, the change could be very significant, isn't it? It's about putting the money where we should be putting it. Here in Glasgow, 100 countries and car companies have pledged to expedite the switch to EV vehicles, including Canada. This is how you encourage others who are hesitating to make that commitment that they should jump on board and join us. That vision of a zero emission vehicle future is not unanimous here. Some big car makers such as Volkswagen and Toyota didn't sign the pledge, apparently worried it will take too long to ramp up all of that new infrastructure. Chris Brown, CBC News, Glasgow. Another wet day across the south coast. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy is here with what we can expect heading into the weekend across BC. Colette, what do we get? Dan, obviously we have to talk about the rain. I mentioned the rainfall warning. We'll take another look at that. But I also want to show you kind of the trend that will be coming in terms of we've got these systems that will be moving in a few over the next few days. And then behind that into the beginning of next week, we'll actually find our temperatures falling off. So a slight rise in the temperatures overnight tonight. Then behind that system, we'll get into some cooler Saturday. We come back up a little bit into Sunday and Monday. Just little subtle changes here. Then watch how how, see how the blues, the contours come down with that colder air that we'll be pushing in. So we'll finally lose some of that atmospheric river of system after system, but that's when we're going to see those temperatures dropping off as well. And just kind of a, a little reminder, it's nice to look back and see, okay, wait a minute, well, what would even be seasonal? <laughs> we're talking about it not being uh, so many days, but average high at this time of year is 9.5, and there are some of your records, record rainfall. And of course, we're looking at significant rain coming through up to 40 to 50 millimeters between what will be falling later on tonight through the overnight and then should be winding down by tomorrow morning. But how sound Fraser Valley. Yes, Metro Vancouver included uh, in here. North and West Vancouver. Just know that's in this region. Uh, Coquitlam, Chilliwack. You see all these areas in our rainfall warning. And by the way, I mentioned it earlier, but wind warning for North Vancouver Island and uh, a little further up towards the central coast as well. Now, this atmospheric river is going to dry up. Well, we've got the band that's coming through overnight tonight with this system. Very, very heavy at times. Uh, the rainfall into tomorrow, we'll see some breaks. And then as we go into Saturday night, into Sunday, the next one comes in. You can actually almost see that like a river coming up. And then we finally break free of it, but that's when that colder air also will be diving down. A quick look at those temperatures then as we go through the night into tomorrow. I mentioned a rising temperature. Look out for those strong winds coming in from the south. They'll die off by tomorrow afternoon. And then a look at what's happening here with your five-day forecast, first of all, but let's get you into the extended as well because I, I have to tell you that that cold air, it is going to stick around for a few days. It's not a one-day only event. We're going to see that Tuesday, Wednesday uh, in to Thursday of next week, Dan. Okay, we'll prep. Thanks, Colette. Remembrance Day often sparks conversations about wartime memories. Not all of them come from veterans, though. Katie Nicholson takes us to a long-term care home in Toronto where stories about internment camps right here in BC are being told to the next generation for the very first time. And a warning for you, some of the language you're going to hear in this story is offensive. Five, B, eight. Oh. Sukai and Yoshie Siyama first crossed paths long before they ended up in the same long-term care home. You have to go back 80 years and thousands of kilometers away to their shared dark history as student and teacher at the same Japanese-Canadian internment camp in Kaslo, BC. And while some memories have faded with age, Others remain fresh, like Kai's teaching style. Oh, you used to be such a strict teacher. Well, I didn't realize it, but I think it's better to be strict. And we always have a good laugh. <laughs> that was a little brat. <laughs> and there are other memories that stubbornly persist. Sometimes at the middle of the night, I say, oh, I, I have a nightmare. Experiences and feelings long repressed to protect her son, Brian Kai. Well, I think there were times when my parents 
did not want to talk about it. And when that happened, they spoke Japanese, and since I couldn't understand it. On the morning of December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. One Sunday, everybody's going crazy. Bomb, 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 bomb. And then I heard, no, you better go inside because they're going to shoot you. That terror was real. Amid strong anti-Japanese sentiment, 21,000 Japanese Canadians were ordered from the BC coast further inland. Kai's family was to be split up. Carrying a rice cooker and sewing machine, they left the downtown Vancouver home her father built with his own two hands and joined thousands of others forced into the BC interior. No newspaper, no radio, no another world company. We didn't even know what's going on into the war. Yoshie Suyama was just 14 when she was sent to Kaslo. We only moved because they kicked us out. Japs out when the war started. What was that like to be told you had to leave New Westminster? Well, we had to leave. We couldn't say yes or no. It was not something that we talked about. And I just think that it was um, maybe too painful for them to relive those memories. At 17, Jane Zielinski's father, Herb Sakaguchi, was shipped off to Slocan, B.C. We lost our house. Kids and I know, as a matter of fact, it's a nice place, you know. The government sold their Kitsilano home from under them. In 1988, Canada compensated internment camp survivors. $21,000, a pittance compared to today's Vancouver real estate prices. They did it. We got evacuated. I'm still around. Mad as hell, but what can I do? It's finished now. Who are these people? Here, after decades, long withheld anger and thwarted dreams expressed out loud for the first time. I was mad. I was mad, yeah. And, and then they, I, I planned to go to university. That's the first time I actually heard her say the word mad the, to the fact that she had to be moved into internment camps. Is this Uncle Ray? That's your brother. No, that's me. That's you? That's you. Feelings better expressed late than never. After long, successful, and happy lives, they had to rebuild from scratch. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. For 100 years, it's been the somber symbol of respect and remembrance. We're going to look back at the history of the poppy after this. I'm Etienne Godet, uh, captain retired from the Canadian Armed Forces. I uh, served 21 years. After my retirement in 2018, I, I would say, I would call it a personal remembrance journey. As you have a bit more time following retirement, you begin to explore different issues related to military service, military history, and um, so I ended up Googling my name, Googling the name Gaudet, family name, to determine how many Gaudets had perished in war or in military service. And to my complete surprise, I discovered that there was a Gaudet, Claudin Gaudet, buried in my home village, who had perished in the Halifax explosion. And I visited him almost immediately, and that led to me discovering several others who had perished in through military service. That there were many soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice and, contrary to what I believe, are not buried in Europe, are not buried in Hong Kong or some other foreign land. We're buried right here in New Brunswick. As a veteran yourself, have, have there been times during this project where it's been difficult for you as you learn more about these fallen soldiers? 
without a doubt, uh, there's been parts of this project that have been quite di difficult for me personally, emotionally. Uh, what stands out is the six uh, deceased heroes from the Afghanistan uh, war and commitment. Uh, that was difficult, very. I served in Afghanistan. I, those, uh, those people are, I consider, brothers. We have a duty to remember, and we have a duty not to forget. Lloyd Edward Briggs died a hero. What really stood out was the magnitude of their sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, and no matter how tragic that is, no matter how uh, depressing that is, uh, one can take solace and one can take motivation from their sacrifice uh, in, in the way we live our lives. So I, I take great strength from their huge sacrifice that they made and I use that moving forward in my own life. This year is a special anniversary for Remembrance Day. It marks 100 years of the poppy as the symbol of respect and remembrance. Simon Nakanechny brings us a look at the past, present, and future of that emblem. The Da Vinci Academy have a special assignment to create and decorate their own poppies, bearing words they think best represent the symbol's meaning. I will brave soldiers because all the soldiers were brave to go to the war. I hope there is never another war because it caught, it's a lot of damage and a lot of people died. <laughs> the kids then bring their creation downstairs to add to a collective mosaic forming a larger flower. We had a discussion of some of them thought of their great-grandparents that were in the war and uh, we discussed how, um, how it affected uh, their families, how difficult it was leaving their loved ones. It was a McGill medical lecturer, John McRae, who first burned the poppy into Canada's consciousness through poetry. McRae served as a doctor in the First World War in the 3rd Canadian General Hospital Regiment. Following the death of a friend at the Second Battle of Ypres, he wrote the famous lines. In Flanders' field the poppies blow, between the crosses, row on row. After the war, a French woman, Anna Guerin, was inspired by McRae's poem. She made cloth poppies and sold them to raise money for war widows and orphans. In 1921, she convinced what would eventually become the Canadian Legion to embrace the flower as a symbol of remembrance. It uh, also is used as a symbol to collect uh, donations, which we can use uh, to help veterans in need, their families, the RCMP, and and in community in general. The Canadian Grenadier Guards bills itself as the country's oldest infantry reserve regiment. Many of its members fought and died in the First World War, including at Vimy Ridge and in Flanders. More recently, its soldiers worked as orderlies in Quebec's nursing homes, and some have served in conflicts like Afghanistan. I've known people that uh, have uh, died, and uh, it was in the American Army, because we served with other armies as well. And yes, there have been uh, roadside bombs, uh, rocket attacks, just as much as, uh, you know, I think of the people that I don't know from, let's say, World War I or World War II. But yes, I still remember those people and I think of their families. Their names and memories. As the memory of the First and Second World Wars slowly fade, the Legion says it's working to keep the poppy relevant. It now sells digital non-fungible token versions on its website and it's partnered with a bank on contactless poppy boxes. What about peacekeepers? But it will be up to a new generation of Canadians to keep the century-old symbol meaningful. I put love because I love all of the people that fought for us and for our country, and I really appreciate it. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. Thank you for joining us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. Our 11 o'clock late news is taking a break tonight. We'll leave you with more from Remembrance Day here in the Lower Mainland. Good night.